I'm so glad that you're here for part two of this series we've called All In. If you miss any of them, catch up with the six-year anniversary. There's a kind of a standalone that honestly initiated this thought of going all in. And what we're doing, what we're studying in the series is really, it's is what, the, what our faith walk uh, was always meant to be. And, uh, and see, a lot of people, they, when they follow God or they serve God or they investigate faith, for many of us, it's kind of a little by little process. Like we put our toe in the water and we're like, let me try it out, let me test it out. And that's all good. We're at whatever stage of faith and where you at on your journey with God, discovery is a place where you can feel free to investigate that and check it out. But I just, I want you to know that this thing called Christianity doesn't work unless you're all in. So you'll, you'll never get the best of God until he has all of you. And that's the truth. And so we're doing a series called All In. What, it, what we're talking about is, is a full devotion and what it looks like to be all in with God. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus issued the invitation, come and follow me. And a lot of people have different thoughts about that. It, it invokes different thoughts when, when you hear Jesus say, come and follow me. And and, and for many of us, it's the reason why we haven't accepted this invitation is because we feel like we don't measure up. Like, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to, you know, I know I'm still, I got mistakes, I got issues, I got things like that. But Jesus was not calling us to total perfection. He was calling us to total devotion. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Not, not how many rules, the do's and the don'ts. That's not what it's about. It's about your heart. He wants you. He wants your heart. That's what it means. And so we're looking at what it, what it looks like to go all in. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, he gave a good like description of what all in looks like. And we're reading it out of the message paraphrase translation here. And if you ever wonder like, what, is, what does God want me to do? What's next for me? Or what does God want me to do? He kind of answers the question for you in the first sentence. So here's what I want you to do. All right, if you ever ask that question, here it is. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life. See, not just, not just some parts of you, the best parts of you, the good parts of you, that's the part that God really likes. No, no, that, that's a lie. God wants all of you, the good, the bad, the ugly. He loves all of you. It, it's just not parts of you. What he wants is, your, is you, your everyday, your ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and he says, go all in with that. Give God all of that. Place that before God as an offering. That's what he wants embracing that what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. And here's what we're going to talk about today. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Today's message is called counter culture. One translation says don't don't be conformed to the pattern of this world because there is a pattern. There is a rhythm that the culture of this world flows in and operates in. But if you want to be a kingdom citizen, someone who's fully devoted to God, you need to know there is a different culture that we need to operate in. It is counter culture. And he says, don't become so well fitted and adjusted into culture without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. And when you do that, he says, you'll be changed from the inside out. You'll be able to readily recognize what God wants you to do. Wouldn't that be awesome? Readily recognize what God wants you to do and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, and that's we're going to talk about the culture around you, because all of us, we're, we're living in a culture around us that, and for many of us, we feel the tension. Like, we feel, we feel God on one arm, and, he's, and we feel the invitation, come follow me. And you feel like a a tug saying, come on, son, come on, my daughter, come, come. But, but we as well feel the pull of the world, don't we? We feel the pull saying, no, 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 this is, this is what you want. This is what's good. This is what's right. This, this is, do this, go here, do that. And we feel the tension pulling us. And, and unlike he said, the culture around you that wants to pull you, drag you down to its level of immaturity. And most of us have feel, we feel that. We feel culture pulling us down outside of the will of God. But God wants to bring out the best in you, to develop well-informed maturity inside of you, is what the Bible says. So to, to, uh, to help us teach this today, uh, if you want to be all in and go all in with God, which I'm encouraging you guys to do, to live a fully devoted life, not a perfect life, but just a life that God is, that he's Lord of all. You're all in. You're fully devoted. And if you want to live that way, then we're going to have to figure out how to, how to do that, how to live fully devoted to God in a culture, in a society that, that does not want God to be involved in anything, that is pulling us in all the wrong 
directions we have to figure out how to live for God in an ungodly world. And so to help us do this, we're going to look at, at um, the book of Daniel today. Um, and for those that don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll set it up for you, the, the story, because we're going to start in Daniel chapter 1. This Daniel and his friends, they had the challenge of, of living for God in an ungodly culture, in one that was full of idol worship. And so to, let me set it up for you. Daniel takes place in 600 B.C., so 600 years before, before Christ. And at this time, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And Babylon is modern-day Iraq. That's where, that's where it's at. And the Israelites were, you know, they were at one time fully devoted to God and, and God had favor on them, but then they turned their back on God and started to worship false idols and things. And so God had just allowed, he allowed, the favor of God left them. And King Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged the cities and tore it apart and took a lot of the people captive, or what the Bible calls an exile. And so that's where Daniel takes place. It takes place in exile. And that's where he's at. He's, Daniel and his friends are, are in exile the enemy's camp in, in, a, in a culture where they know God, they love God, and they want to live for God, but all around them is a culture that does not, does not want what they want. They're feeling the tension, so how do we do it? And we're going to let them teach us some things um, today. Let's look at it, you guys, um, in Daniel chapter 1, starting with verse 1 through 6. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. So that would have been their church. They stole some stuff from their church. And they, they carried it off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put it in the treasure house of his God. And it says, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, and that's an important guy to remember in our study today. Ashpenaz, he's the chief of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect and handsome. That's like some of you in here right now. Some of you have been taken, all right, snatched up. That's, that's, that was your opportunity for you. Come on, that was your opportunity. Some wife was supposed to be like, that's right, but you lost it. <laughs> anyway, so without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So they, they took the cream of the crop, basically, the ones who are the best and the brightest, and they were to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. Now that's important too because uh, the, the Jews had certain dietary restrictions and laws. So there, there were some things on the king's table and that they would allocate for them to eat and drink that they were not supposed to eat and drink. They were to be trained, and then continue. They were to be trained three years, and after they were that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these, uh, some were some from Judah: Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And these are the guys that we're going to study today. We're going to study these guys because they they had to figure out um, how to live for God in an ungodly culture. They were that that culture was telling them to do some things that they did not want to do. They, they didn't want to do it. And the question is today, what do you do when culture contradicts your convictions? What are you going to do when culture contradicts your convictions? Well, let me say it this way. What are you going to do when, when culture changes? Will you change with it? So let me, let me say this. Culture always changes. God never changes. All right? Culture's always changing. I mean, my kids keep me young and keep me, they tell me what's cool and stuff. I asked, I asked my daughter, have you done your homework yet? And she goes, yeet. <laughs> I don't, you know, bless you? God bless you? She did not, how is that an acceptable answer? Yeet. I was getting food, I brought some food home, and they're all, one of my daughter goes, thanks my guy. <laughs> Wait, what now? So, so the culture well, those things, there's nothing wrong with those things in language, but, but what are you going to do when culture actually um, is pulling you in a direction that, that your convictions are, are conflicting? But what are you going to do? do? Are you going to are you gonna change with culture and then ask God to change with it? Which some people do. And some churches or even, even try to do nowadays, oh, this part of the Bible, you know, well, really, God didn't understand the culture we're living in. And so we got to like, we got to modify the context of this to fit our culture. You don't modify your culture to God. You need, you need to, or you don't modify God to your culture. We need to be modified to God's will. 
Amen? And so today, I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to give you a list today. That's not what I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, this is what's wrong, and this is what's right. You don't need a list because you have a Holy Spirit. And, that's, and so my role, my role in all this is to lead you to Him and to help you to hear from Him. And then you just do what the Lord tells you to do. But you feel the tension. And for all of us, it's a different tension pulling in a, in a different direction. But what are we going to do when culture is shifting because something's going to change and i promise you if you want to go all in and if you want to be fully devoted and give yourself to to god he will change you from the inside out and he'll bring out the best in you he will so what are we what are we going to do i'm telling you culture culture will try to if you let it culture will do and what i'm going to show you three things to you and it's trying to it's trying to do three things to you if you let it it will do these three things let me show you the scriptures first and then I'll show you what, what culture is trying to do. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 7, it says, picking up the story where we left off, the chief official, that Ashpenaz guy, gave them, look at this, new names. He gave them new names. He said, no, no, we don't like what you're called. We're going we're gonna to rename you guys to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And that's where we get like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were names given to them by the culture around them. And so here's the first goal. The first goal of culture, you guys, is culture wants to rename you. Culture wants to rename you. It's going to try to change your identity from who God made you to be to who the world wants you to be. And it's a direct attack on your God-given destiny. Some of you are still living the labels that other people have put on you. What other people said of you or what the doctor diagnosed you or what your parents said or your teacher said and you're trying to live a label and you're carrying this label around and it's not who God says you are. God has a redeemable name for you. He's got a new name for you. So let me show you. I mean, this is so eerie that when you look at the four Hebrew names that these guys had and then you compare it to the four Babylonian names that they were given... It's scary. It's crazy what, what culture is trying to do. It's not in your notes, but let me show you these names and what they mean. Daniel means God is my judge. God alone is my judge. He's the one, he's the one I look to. He's, he's my judge, God alone. And they said, no, Daniel, you're not going to be called that. We're going to call you Belteshazzar. Bell's the one who protects your life. It's not God. God's not just, no, you don't need to look to God. Bell is the one who's your protector. And so what culture is trying to do is to shift our focus from worshiping God to worshiping false idols. And we talked about this last week, that this is the, the influence of, of culture on our, on our life. That, that instead of any time that we put our hope in things other than God, we, we try to get our security, we try to get our happiness, we try to find fulfillment in things before God, that becomes an idol in our life. And then look at this next name. Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious. Oh, my God, it's, it's, it's just, my God is so good. He's gracious to me. Man, my God is good. They said, no, you're, you're going to be called Shadrach. That's what you're going to be called, which means I am fearful of God. And that's what the world will, will try to tell you. It's this focus from that God is actually good and has good for you that to, to God is bad. Oh, you don't want to serve God. Oh, you don't want to become a Christian. Man, you become a Christian, then... Dang, you're just going to live a limited life. There's all these lists, these do's and don'ts, and, and oh, if you're a Christian, you'll be a weirdo. You don't want to be a weirdo. And, and culture has these labels instead of, and can I tell you something? Everything that God has for you is good. It's good. Serving God is the best decision you will make in your entire life. Our God is awesome, is loving, is merciful, is gracious. He is good. And he has good for you. That's a lie of the enemy. Some people think, oh, I finally surrendered to Jesus. Stop that. Like you finally gave in, huh? Just finally gave in to Jesus. Come, this is the, this is the best life right here. Here's this other name was Mishael, which means who is what God is. Which is basically a statement like, like there is no one like my God. Who is like my God, who is like what God is? There is, it's this confidence. There's a confidence of like, no one is like my God. And they said, no, 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 that's not what you're going to be called. You're going to be called Meshach, which is I am despised, contemptible, and humiliated. And you see this even happen in our culture today, that the focus is shifting from confidence to insecurity. It's, it's I'll say it this way, like, like culture wants you to move from confidence to cowardice. And so they'll say, they'll say, oh, you better hush up. You can't talk about your faith here. 
You can't share that. You can't act like that. You can't. No, you better be quiet. And there's a separation from church and state, which gets me irritated. My goodness. Isn't that, doesn't that, the separation from church and state was, they're using it wrong, man. It was so government would not infringe on, on us. And they're saying, they're trying to use it that we're not supposed to infringe on government. They're backwards. It's a backwards culture that we're living in. Instead of having this confidence who is like our God, they want you to live cowardly and insecure lives, not sharing your faith or living out your faith. So it's just this like, oh, we're just going to meet over here in our church. Oh, we'll just meet over here. Hope, we, hope to see you in heaven. Okay, bye. And, and, if, and if you have coworkers that are Christians, like, oh, you're a Christian too. Let's go over here. Let's go. How are you doing? And it's just, instead of, instead of this confidence, like, who is like our God? There is no one. And I'm not saying you have to be, like, rude or in people's face. That's not at all what it's about. But it is about this confidence, this grace that we can walk our faith and our convictions out but culture doesn't want you to do that does it it doesn't look at this last one it means azariah means yahweh has helped and that term yahweh was a very like a personal name for god it was it was you, you didn't even use it that much because it was so personal so yahweh is he's so cl- he's my god he's close he's he's so close to me he's actually helped me my god has helped me and they said no we don't want your god close we, you're not, you're, no, that's not, you're a servant of Nebo. You're a servant of this false god. And culture is trying to shift our focus from sonship to slavery. And instead of having this relationship with God where God is close, where God is a part of your life and where he's helping your life, they, they would rather you follow religious rules, be a part of a religious system. Look, when culture contradicts your convictions, Listen to me, guys. You got to know who you are. You have to know who you are in Christ when culture, because culture, this world around you is going to bombard you with lies. It's going to try to tell you who you are, and you need to know who you are in Christ. Look at the next verse in verse 8. Just continue the story. It says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with that royal food and wine. He said, No, no. I'm not going to go there. I know that's, that's part of our, the things that you want me to eat, but I, I'm just, I'm making a decision here, man. And he asked the chief official, that guy Ashvanaz, for permission not to defile himself this way. I want you to see, notice the honor in this text. Notice the respect. Daniel wasn't like, y'all going to hell. You're just, you're living wrong, man. And he wasn't like condemning them or judging them. Or pointing Look at the honor, man. That he just, he just resolved within himself. And he even asked permission. He was respectful of his authority. And he said, you know what? I just can't do that, man. Can I, can I have your permission? Because I don't want to live that way. Why is that? Number two, because culture is trying to tame you. Culture wants you to be a bunch of people who are not living out your convictions, who are not living out your faith. It's trying to lure us into something that we know is wrong. Oh, but you know what? It's not going to hurt that bad. And I certainly don't want to be in conflict with everybody and on everybody's nerves and fighting people and and against everybody all the time. So I guess I'll do it. I mean, everybody else is doing it. So it's it's the world. It's just the world we live in. It's the world we live in. And so we compromise our convictions and culture is trying to tame you. And again, you don't need me telling you what that is and what what that is that culture is trying to do. You, you, You have a Holy Spirit. You have a Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And so you know what that, I think that list is different for every one of us. What culture and what the enemy is trying to do. And you don't need, you don't need to force your convictions on other people either. And make them feel inferior. But you also don't need to not live out your convictions as well. Listen, when culture contradicts those things, you need to, you need to not lose your convictions, church. Know the Word of God. Know the Holy Spirit and follow God. God, church. Follow God, not culture. Follow God. Amen? Amen. Here is, uh, let's pick it up, verse 9. It says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. So he's, he's, he's asking him, hey, I, don't, I can't eat this. I don't, this is, this, I, I'm, I'm not going to do it, man. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned you food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? So it was their belief that, that if you ate this food, 
at the, the, the king's table was provided, you'd actually be stronger and healthier and just and, and smarter. It made you smarter. It made you better. So he said, hey, man, if you don't eat this, you're going to be worse off. And I'm going to get in trouble if I let you do that. The king would have my head because of you. So Daniel says to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And that's where we get the modern day Daniel fast right there. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Here's what I want you to know, you guys. If you're going to be fully devoted and live all in for God and this ungodly culture and world we live in, you will be tested. There will be tests. Your faith will be tested. You will, you will have pressure points along your journey. You will come to defining moments in your walk of faith. So it'll be more than the Holy Spirit you feel tugging you, going, hey, come follow me. This is what I, this is what I have for you. That's not, that's not it. This is it. It'll be more than that. There'll come a time where culture gets up in your face and gets loud and says, no, this is what you ought to do. And it's at that point where you have to say, I'm not living that way. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say yes to that. But everyone's doing it. And it's the world we live in. I'm not going there. Why? Because it's the third thing that culture is trying to do. Culture is trying to claim you as its own. And you need to know that there is a battle for your soul happening right now. You got the world pulling on one arm and the, and, and the Holy Spirit saying, come follow me on the other arm. But here, and you get to cast the deciding vote. Which way are you going to lean? Which way are you going to give into? There will always be a moment of, of where your faith is tested. So that that chief official allowed them he tested them for 10 days you can go read it in daniel chapter one but after that 10 days they actually there it says that their countenance was even better and they were more healthy than all the other people that all the other in the, in the in the slaves that ate of the king's table and it picks up in verse 20 it says in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them he found them 10 times better than all the rest, and I'm here to declare to you today that following God is not worse, it's not bad, he only has good, listen, following Jesus is 10 times better than everything that the world would have, 100 times better than what the world has to offer, it's better, God is better, the enemy will lie to you and try to tell you he's not, so here's the question, the question is, will my identity come from God or from the world, from culture? Who's going to have the say to speak into me? Who am I? Will, will God say that, or am I, going to, am I going to allow the world to tell me who I am? Second Corinthians says it like this, that he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. See, what this means is we need to abandon every label on us that is not of God. Every, every name on us, every label on us, you stop accepting what others have said about you, what, what others have labeled you, how others have defined you, what this culture says about you, and you start believing what God says about you. How God has created you is good, and that he defines you, not our culture. You are not defined by how much money you make. You're not defined by your education. You're not defined by your money, your successes, your failures. You're not defined by that car. You're not defined by that house you say is yours, but the bank actually owns it. You are not defined by that. You are defined by God. God defines me. Amen? God defines me. He identifies you as his own. So how do we, how do we live counterculture? How do we live for God? And then God, there will always be tests. And you can read all throughout Daniel that that, that wasn't the only test they got. They, they actually, there was multiple tests in the book of Daniel. If you go read it, there's multiple tests they, re, they received. In Daniel chapter 3, there's a, another uh, test that, that they had, living for God in an, in an ungodly culture. They actually, they, they, the king signed a royal decree. And they created this gold statue, an idol. And they said, everybody at a certain time needs to bow down and worship this idol. Everybody, by royal decree. And by the way, if you don't, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace and burned to death. Yeah. 
And you all thought you were persecuted. <laughs> my boss hates me. <laughs> my family doesn't understand my beliefs. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. I play. I'm just kidding. I know it's hard. I get it. I get it. And it is. It, that's a test. I get it. But these guys, these guys were faced with life and death. And Daniel said, we will not bow down. We're not going to bow down. In Daniel chapter 3, he's, it says, uh, or the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego rather replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, come on, some of you need a but even if kind of faith. Look, listen, your faith is worth if it only stands up when you get your way. Hey, you need a but even if kind of faith. You need a faith that, that shows up when the door closes. You need a faith that shows up when the opportunity, you need a faith that shows up in the fire, in the dark. That's where faith shows up. But even if, hey, I'm not going to do it, but even if, even if God doesn't deliver me, we want you to know we're still not bowing down. We're not, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So how do we do this? How do we live for God? How do we, how do we operate here in this, like, in, in, honestly, our Babylonian culture around us? It's a culture that, that does not want to do what God desires to do. It's going in a totally, pulling us in a totally different direction. Let me give you some counterculture points. If you want to be all in, fully devoted, for God, and live counterculture, here are some things that we need to do. Number one, you got to get around new faces and new places. You got to get around some new, new faces and new places. In fact, this was a tactic Bab the Babylonians used. You know, when they besieged Israel and Judah, they took the best and brightest. This, this tactic is called acculturation. And what they would do is try to, try to take them out of their culture and, and remove them from that and put them around new faces and new places because they knew that, that if, if we can put you around these new faces and new places, soon, little by little, you would lose your values, your beliefs, your customs, your traditions. That's what acculturation is, is where you lose those things and you start accommodating to your faces and your places. And if you really want to be fully devoted, you have, there is no other way to get around it. You got to get around some new faces and new places, you guys. Jesus invited us to come and, and follow him and to, 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 he was teaching a whole new kingdom is what he was. Most of Jesus' teaching was the, the, the teaching of the kingdom of God. You look in the gospels, he was teaching a kingdom culture is what he was teaching. He says, hey, you guys are, you guys only know this culture. That's all you know. Come and follow me. I want to show you a different way of living, a different culture. I want you to be able to see this culture, know this culture, access the power of this culture. I need you to come out, come follow me and see a different pattern, a different rhythm, a different culture. See, Jesus used the culturation himself. He said, hey, no, 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 come on out, come follow me, and I want to show you a different rhythm, a different culture to live in. And so last week we talked about, you know, some of the people that did not respond to the come follow me. And there was this one guy, I showed you this scripture that said, oh, I will follow you, but first, oh, but first I, but, but, but first I got to do this and got to do that. And that's one of the reasons why some people don't follow God. They have too many, but first, I need to do this or that. They put things before, before God. I want to show you another person who didn't respond to following God. And it was, it wasn't because of the priority thing and the but first thing. It's actually because of his places and his faces. That's why. His name is Nicodemus, John chapter 3. It says this, that there was this Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was not just a Pharisee, he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, so he sat at a, at a good table. He was around, he, he, was, he was set up. He was in some good places and around some good faces. And it says he came to Jesus, look at this, at night, where it didn't cost him anything. At night, where no one else could see. At night, when it was convenient, more convenient for him. At night, he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has actually come from God. We know it. You're sent from God because no one can perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with you. We know you're sent from God, and God is with you. But he didn't follow Jesus because of his faces in place. He didn't want to leave his people or his 
places. And that's what so many, so many Christians, like there's polls that are done every year about how uh, in, our, in America of who considers themselves to be a Christian. Do you know that almost 80% of America considers themselves to be a Christian? So we consider, like I'm a, I'm a Christian, I know, and some of us go, I know you, I know Jesus, your Lord. I know you do miracles. I know you're the Lord. I know God is with you, but, but I just can't leave my people, my faces, and my, and my places. I mean, I'll, so I'll show up on Sundays every now and then. I'll give you a little bit here, a little bit there, but this, this process of acculturation will never happen. You will never discover the rhythm of the kingdom of God if you don't say yes to come follow me. If you don't get out of some of that stuff. And some of you, you got some, you need some new faces and you need some new places. Thank God, thank God Daniel had a small group. Amen. See what I did there? <laughs> Daniel, thank God Daniel had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because here they are trying to live for God trying to trying to live for God in a culture in a Babylonian culture that was pulling them in the wrong direction so when one was weak the other was strong that they had encouragement from one another Jesus is saying come no no come follow me I want to teach you this culture and, and by the way that was one of the misconceptions that the disciples had about this kingdom culture that Jesus was going to establish like this whole come follow me thing they thought that Jesus was going to establish literally a kingdom culture he was going to he was going to establish a new kingdom culture here like 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 eradicate it sit on the throne and Jesus like no I didn't say come follow me so we can create a new culture out here I said come follow me so I can create a new culture in you and then you are going to change this world by what I give you by what I put inside of you See, if you, want, if, you really, if you want to go all in and you want to live this fully devoted, you have to get around new faces and new places. Amen? Amen? Here's the second thing that we need to do, and this comes from Daniel's story here, is don't run from the fire. Don't run from the fire. Now, I, I didn't notice I didn't say, uh, you know, play with fire. Some of you are all playing with fire, okay? You're seeing how close you can get to the flames and not get burned. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that there, there will be tests. There will be trials. There will come times where culture gets in your face. There will be times and you will be tested in this culture that we are living in and you cannot bow down. You cannot back down. You cannot retreat or run away from that fire, from that test. Listen, that test and fire did not come to burn you or destroy you. It has come to refine you. God wants to use God's kingdom as a fire. God's kingdom is, he will use the fire to perfect you not to destroy you. So Daniel chapter 3, it continues the story. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they would not bow down to that idol and worship that statue. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they throw him in there, and then the king Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up that we threw into the fire? And they said, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, there's another one in there. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Listen to me. God does his greatest work in the fire. Some of you want the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but you don't want to step into the fire. The fire is where the faith is produced. Stop running from the flame. Stop running from the fire. Don't be afraid to step into the fire. God's kingdom is a fire. Think about the upper room experience where Jesus said, don't, you, don't go try to change this world without this fire without the Holy Spirit fire. And after a while, then praying the, the Holy Spirit to sit on them, it says, and rested on their heads like a fire. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And those guys, full of the kingdom culture of God, changed the world. When I, when I think about Moses in the burning bush on the top of Mount Sinai, that bush, the Bible says, was burning, but was not consumed. It was on fire, but it was not being consumed. And because of that, Moses, it says, stepped towards 
this fire. You see, when the world sees you step into your trial, step into that fire, and it does not consume you, they're going to be attracted to that flame. They're going to be attracted to your life. They say, wow, they're walking through that. They're going through that. But they got some peace. They have joy. They got a fourth man in the fire. Amen, somebody. Don't be afraid of the fire. Step into those moments. How do we live for God? How do we live counterculture, fully devoted? Amen. Don't be afraid of the fire. Get some new, pa- new, places, new faces and places. And here's number three. We need to live with a sense of purpose and urgency. Live with a sense of purpose and urgency. And, and I want you to know, church, your days, listen, are literally numbered. We, don't, we are not promised this day. We are not promised tomorrow that we need to live if we want to live fully devoted then we need to live with a sense of purpose and urgency. And I want you to hear this, that God has a purpose. He has meaning for your life. The reason why you are breathing and that you are here today and alive today is because God loves you. God wants to do something in you and through you. You have purpose. And and, and the best gift that you can give yourself is to know that purpose and live it out. And I'm telling you, if you do that, if you do that, you will solve 99% of your problems. 99% of your problems will be solved if you just discover and start living out your purpose. It doesn't mean that the fire is not going to be there. It doesn't mean that the test doesn't come and trials aren't going to come. It's just while you're going through it, you got purpose in the pain. You have purpose in the middle of your pain. It's not that it's, it's, yeah, it hurts, it burns. I mean, it's not good. But thank God I got a mean, I got purpose I'm living for. I got a vision for my life. I got a direction I'm going. There's purpose in my pain. You live with a sense of purpose and urgency when you're fully devoted to God, knowing that we're not promised. This is how David says it in, in Psalm chapter 39. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Like some of you don't like thinking about that day, eternal life, afterlife heaven david said no lord remind me i want to live with purpose i want to make every day every relationship count i want to make every moment count every opportunity remind me god how brief my time on earth will be remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away he says my life is no longer than the width of my hand an entire lifetime is just a moment to you human existence is but a breath to you Live with a sense of purpose and urgency. This is what Next Steps, these classes that we do every month here at Discovery, are all about. To help connect you to the body of Christ, to God's church, and to your purpose. So that you can have purpose in the middle of the pain and get to it. And get doing it. All right? It, I'm telling you, it won't take the fire away, but it gives you purpose in the middle of the pain. It gives you something greater. And that's what I think a lot of the challenges are for many of you, is that, is that you just... You don't have something greater than the pain in your, in your life. All you have is the pain and nothing get greater. What you need is purpose. What you need is a vision for a living. All right, so get around some new places and faces. That's what we're going to do. We're going to not run from the fire anymore. We're going to live with a sense of purpose and urgency. And here's the last thing I want to encourage you to do. Hey, church, do it now. Do it now. Hey, if not now, when? When are you going to do this? Why are we putting this off? Wait, if, if, if God is good and he has good for me, why am I waiting on this? I feel the tension. I feel the tug. Why, why, do I, why do I live on the fence? Why am I living in the middle of this? Why am I giving in to this other direction? Why not just go all in? I've been making this challenge over the last couple of weeks, and maybe you haven't heard it or maybe you haven't responded to it, but I want to make it again. Mark this day, literally, in your calendar. I want to challenge you. Mark it. It's the 22nd of September. And go all in with God today. And just see, just see if God is not faithful. Fully devote yourself. I'm talking about fully devote. Don't, don't do this halfway Christianity thing. Don't, don't do this like I'm, I'm kind of in, not in, coming to God at night kind of thing. I know you're Lord, but I'm going to leave it. No, no, no. Go all in with God. Mark the day and give him 12 months. Give him one year. And some of you are thinking like, that's a long time. How can I start with like one month, a couple weeks or something. Listen, you have, you have given more time to so many other things in your life. You've given, you've given more times to relationships that actually that have hurt you more than they helped you. 
that didn't work out. You've given your time to careers that, that actually were dead end. You've given time to hobbies, that, more time to, to habits. More, you, you give more. Let's give God, the creator and sustainer of life, give him one year of your full devotion and just see if it's not ten times better if it's if his if his way for you and plan for you is not good just test it one year you guys i'm telling you and what does that look like what does it look like to go all in just here's the easy way is just say yes just run the play that discovery has run the play i'm t- we're not gonna like over busy and inundate you with things to do no we, we're intentional on giving you intentional steps for your development and for your discipleship and for your purpose you, you, so if there's a group go to it go to a group get in new faces and places i'm not saying you got to go to all go to a group every day of the week which some of you do but i'm just saying go to one at least go to one group if there's a service be at it if there's a prayer pray it if there's a worship night worship at it conference get the ticket whatever it is just do that just do that go all in give god everything and see just see what god can do with your life i mean you've you've seen you've seen the result of what life is when you give yourself to those other things and whatever those other things are again no list whatever the tug it whatever you've seen the result of that life try this i want this for you so bad church to just try to taste and see if it's not good if it's not better second corinthians says it like this i tell you now is the time of god's favor now is the day of salvation he says that's not something in the future no god is now now is the day to go all in can i pray for you let's bow our heads and close our eyes together I want to pray for you because I